Today's market call is presented by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow and SoFi. Get your money right all in one app. New York Community Bank Corp down 40% today. <laughs> uh, market call, Guy Adami. EY from SoFi, Dan Nathan, 1 o'clock on the East Coast, March 6th, Wednesday. Friday at 3 p.m. NHL trade deadline. Case you, you, you haven't been watching no, the market call week. all week. And, no, no, and the got... NHL. Tra- Stop it. The NHL trade line is trade deadline is this Friday at 3 oh, p.m. That's right. You, you so you have it. not been watching the show because no, we've opened each market call. Of course I did. Yeah. And oh, I will and, talk about it again yeah, tomorrow. I will right. talk about it until 3 o'clock on Friday. Yeah. Okay. But, but not right. for the whole show. Not the whole show today. No. So we got a lot. We, have a, we do have a lot to talk about. As I mentioned, it is Wednesday. Yeah. Market shrugging off yesterday i do shrugs in the gym from time to time yes. i don't know why there's with no weights real or without weights excuse me that's uh, you know so that was pretty that's pretty funny by you actually yeah. and if it's if it's thursday it's not that was not <laughs> tomorrow is butters today is ey from SoFi, and we obviously are privy to some of the work that she does correct let's take a look at today's rundown because i love what they put together our crack staff here lots to discuss fed cuts be careful what you wish for people is the NASDAQ looking at a hungry alligator? Oh, there you Twin go. Peaks, Bitcoin. It's amazing. That Bitcoin reversal yesterday, I thought, that's it. Yeah. But it's raging we, back again You could today. have said the same about software stocks, about AI Could have said the same about, about many things. Stuff, yeah. And if it's Wednesday, which is today, we do a Q&A. Now, unfortunately, Swizzle has to 5,000 at 130. But don't worry, because Dan and EY will be here. That's to- why she's in your seat right now. I don't have it. It's kind of your seat. We traded. I move around from time to time. So we'll get a nice two shot later. That's the two of you. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to crawl into the camera. I'm going to limbo. No, no, you don't have (laughs) to. Elizabeth was actually singing the limbo song before you you, you went to the bathroom. Anyway, let's chat. How are you, Dan? I'm doing okay here. It's always great to have Liz in studio with us. Um, You know, listen, a lot going on this week. We were all on the On the Tape podcast on Monday morning together. And, Guy, I actually misspoke. You had mentioned that, um, you know, Jay Jay Powell was speaking Wednesday and Thursday. For whatever reason, the calendar I was looking at only had Thursday. Obviously, he's speaking to both houses. This is a former Humphrey Hawks. So let's just talk about yesterday, I think, for software stocks and many tech stocks, it was the worst day in a year. Okay, and you would have thought that maybe there'd be some follow through without any specific news in the space. Okay, but there wasn't. We basically got a preview pre opening of what Fed Chair Powell was going to say. Mm-hmm. We have the 10 year yield below 4.10%. That's the first time in about a, a month or so. And is that enough, Liz, to get basically tech stocks screaming? Now, I'm going to say all of that. But if you think about it right now, we have the S&P that's up 80 basis points. We have the NASDAQ 100 that's up 1.1% or so. Mm-hmm. We still see Apple is basically flat on the day. We see Google that's done uh, flat on the day. And we see Tesla. That was the story yesterday. That's what helped lead stuff to the downside. But look at that. Look what's going on. A lot of green. It's a sea of green just because he yeah. yields. Is that what's going on here? I mean, I think that's part of it. I, I think it's a little misguided. And mm-hmm. obviously, you can't take a one day move and extrapolate that out and say, okay, that's how it's going to work now from this point forward. But there's still a lot of relationships in the market that are just off, right? As as yields have gone up over time, mm-hmm. we've seen multiples climb as well, which just doesn't really make a ton of sense. You've got a relationship with gold today. Gold is making new highs. It's at now overbought levels. Mm-hmm. In this environment, that just feels odd. It doesn't match up with how things should usually react. So I think that this is a day maybe of relief after we had a couple down days and people were worried that that was the beginning of something deeper. And maybe this is trying to prove that it's not the beginning of something deeper and and some buy the dippers here. Uh, on yields down a little. I bit. mean, it's amazing though. Like just just the stuff that got hit hard that reversed off its highs. You know, yesterday, guy, it's just raging here. But here's another one. You know, crude oil. So you know, let's just mention relationships, mm-hmm. right? So let's let's look at this. It's back towards eighty bucks here. You know what I mean? So again, you know, we're hanging around, down. man. Yeah, like so. So talk to me, like like. Listen, this is a confounding sort of market. If you were like in the camp, if you're a bull and you're saying, let's take some of the froth off yesterday into today, into maybe, you know, Fed Chair Powell tomorrow, whatever the heck it is, or the jobs, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, like you would have thought that would be healthy. This is kind of unhealthy. Well, you know? I think this start again, I, I, I'm i not, I'm hard pressed to understand what finally triggered yesterday's sell off. It does not necessarily matter. But to Elizabeth's point, I mean, yields moving down 
again, why are yields moving down? Is it the right reasons or the wrong? Or are there even right reasons at this point? Yeah. I think a lot of what's going on in China is finally starting to find its way into our market. At least yesterday, it seemed to be the case. I think in large part, the move in gold to a certain extent might be predicated on that understanding that yields going down was probably a good thing. Now you're getting a follow through again today. Crude oil going higher, really interesting, right? Yeah. Is that just a function of a weakening dollar? I, I don't know. Or is there more at work here? You know, if we could throw up a quickly sort of an OIH chart, you mentioned that the other day, yeah. you know, you're back above 300 again. This thing has flirted with 275 on a number of occasions. It's bounced. You can look at that little uptrend line that we've drawn. I mean, whether that's valid or not doesn't matter, but we're right up against that 200-day moving average that we broke down through a while back. So we'll see if we get here and fail, or is this the time we get to it and extend through to the upside? Of course, you know what I think. I think we extend higher. Obviously, a lot of people think the crude trade is just sort of you know, nowhere at this point. Yeah, you know, our friend Doug Cass over there at Seabreeze Partners, he writes for realmoney.com. He sends us a note here saying uh, equities decoupling from the macro, but will it last? And so that's what in, in his notes um, from today. And I think that's kind of what we're talking yeah. about right here. You know, when you think about just some of the data, right? So we're having weaker manufacturing uh, data. We're seeing weaker employment data. We're seeing a lot of weak data out of China. Like none of it speaks to that GDP. And, and oh, do we get a look at GDP that's weak or something like that you know like I, I know that obviously came in much hotter in 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 2023 than some expected it's still looking uh, you know basically well above what the fed had suggested i think when fed chair powell was speaking in mid-december at his presser they said 1.4 percent that's their expectation we're seeing some readings that are almost mm -hmm. doubled that i mean that's mm -hmm. really what equities are keying off of and then now lower rates liz because the data is weaker is that the thing that's going to be good and, and let's flash this up because we kind of teased it careful what you wish for with rates this was from doug um this morning we talked about this i guess for months now i look really stupid talking about it it's like let's flash that slide up there it's like again you know it's the period of the pause in the mm -hmm. raising rates that's oh, yeah. been good for equities like there's the slide right there that's from doug earlier today like are we gonna have to rehash this a little bit as as the as markets just keep making new highs every day here well, this is something, this goes back to what Guy and I think were saying last fall when we started to price in cuts. And I kept saying, stop wishing for that. Right, because yeah. when those start, that's when the market is going to falter. And you actually want this period between the last hike and the first cut to be longer because we can at least, at the very least, muddle through. So the cuts, and here's the other thing is you can look at a chart like this and say, well, maybe it, it just isn't always lining up that perfectly. That might be true. But the reality of why the Fed cuts rates, it's never the way that they're hoping it right. goes. It's never that, oh, you know what? We just have to get back to normal. And, and I have an issue with the normalization argument, period. But we just have to get back to normal and we'll do it very slowly and everybody's going to be comfortable with it. And we'll, we'll get back to a place where everything is humming along at a comfortable rate. Mm -hmm. If we're going to normalize policy, which is what the bulls would suggest or the soft landing camp would suggest about how the Fed's going to do this because they want to, you have to normalize everything else, too. You have to normalize inflation. You have to normalize unemployment. You have to normalize margins. You have to normalize revenue growth. You have to normalize consumer spending. You have to normalize consumer debt, right? And I think there's just not enough playing through that entire thought process where the normalization process is what we see on this chart as they try to normalize, that's when we realize, oh, crap, everything else is going to have to normalize. Well, at the same I, I'm time. so with you on that. And what's interesting is I don't know if people fully understand what normal is. I think for many people, normal is zero interest rate policy that's been in place. <laughs> no, I mean that no, sincerely. I, I, I mean, I think they think that's where we should be. It's interesting. I was watching, again, I flip around on the different stations, but I was watching MSNBC last night and I sort of stumbled onto a conversation about the problem that Biden's having. And one of the uh, commentators- not getting, like if the economy, if he start, if, if the people are starting to pull better on the economy, he he's would, not getting the credit. That's what you no, mean, that's and, the problem. And one of the, I think it was, trying to think of the gentleman's name, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But his point was, Janet Yellen should talk to the Fed and have them lower rates because that would help. And it's interesting to hear that thought pattern. And I understand at a certain level what he was yeah. talking about, but- if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, that's the last thing that we should be looking for. But he was speaking to the fact that in a high interest rate environment, there are a lot of people that are getting squeezed out because of inflation. With all that said, 
Be careful what you wish for. Elizabeth's been saying that for a while. By the way, that that chart that we had up is from Game of Trades, which is a great Twitter account without question. And again, people are hoping for a Fed rate cut. I don't think that that's really – they think that that means lower rates means knee-jerk reaction, higher equities. Historically, Dan, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, and so again, on Wednesdays, we get a preview of Liz, uh, Liz's note that drops on Thursdays. You can find that in your email box. You guys go know where to go, sofi.com slash blog. I think that's a blog. Um, guy, do you know what a blog stands for? You know, there was a period of time where, you know, people were bloggers, and then they did it on the video front, Blogging. and they were bloggers. Yeah. And it's so like, you, you know what I wanted to say to yeah, all these no. people? Well, you, you, listen, now you have your Go up yourselves. You, yeah, well, okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, okay. Let, let's um no not know. elizabeth no 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 no. so um so we have a little bit of a preview of your uh blog that drops uh -huh. tomorrow um uh -huh. and it's interesting because you're focused on fed speak um and so one of the things i think is interesting guy is like careful what you wish for yeah but fed chair powell keeps saying you know i think you're wishing too much for cuts that might mm -hmm. not right. come in, in the so talk to us a little bit about how you're thinking about this because yep. again he gets increasingly well, maybe you're saying less hawkish but he's been very pretty hawkish and the market's like if you're like an equity investor you don't care right now i guess yeah. you're just buying well it. so the chart that will show it's a it's an index that Bloomberg creates, it's a Fed speak index, and it's for all the Fed speakers, mm -hmm. not just Powell. But it's particularly apt today because he is speaking, right? And he reiterated again that they need to be more confident that inflation is on that sustainable path to 2%. So here's where this matters. You can see in this chart, you can read this one of two ways. And honestly, I think that there are so many things in today's market that you can read one of two ways and both be right. Mm -hmm. You could look at this chart and say, okay, look how hawkish it was back in 2022. Obviously the market was having a hard time. And then we became incrementally less hawkish through 2023. Things got a little better and look at how much less hawkish we are now. Okay. But we're still above zero. We're still hawkish. And this is at a time where even in today's trading session, markets seem to be trading on the idea of lower yields, which would support a dovish stance. And that's not what we're getting yet. What I think is going to happen this year, I don't know when exactly, but I think as summer approaches, because that's where the question mark is about whether or not the Fed's actually going to start moving, is that we're going to have this really bad game of chicken between the Fed and the market. And I think the Fed's threshold for pain is much higher than the market wants it to be. But we don't know where it is yet. And I think we're going to find out that they are going to stick to their mandate, not, not only for credibility purposes, mm -hmm. but because I think they firmly believe that high and sticky inflation is a real problem for everybody, for corporations, for consumers, for the government, for everybody. So I think that they're going to continue to fight that. And even if the market is correcting pretty badly, I think they stay higher. And I think that they don't give the market what it wants. It depends on how long that goes on for, that disagreement. And that could be what tips us into a really volatile period. Or if we end up finding some kind of agreement or compromise on the timing of when they start cutting, then maybe we're okay. But to be continued. Yeah, to be continued without question. And we've talked about this last year. We haven't brought it up in a while. But I think there are people out there that believe the Fed put in the S&P is back. Yes. And obviously, the market is trading that way. And I would, I don't think it necessarily is. I don't think they're as focused on the S&P as the market seems to think they are. I think they're focused on probably two things, the credit markets, which are seemingly fine, and the unemployment data, which is obviously seemingly fine. If the credit markets start to show signs, that's when you can say, okay, they're going to move faster than I thought. If the unemployment rate starts moving up in a significant fashion, which I do think will happen, I think that could be a trigger for them as well. But we're nowhere near either one right now. So to your earlier point, you know, I think it must have mortified some of these folks at the Fed to think that the market is somehow pricing in six rate cuts this year. I think we've come back to some normalcy in terms of what the, the realization is with maybe three. And I still think they're probably some. I think if you were to ask them, they're somewhat outraged by that as well, given what their real mandate is. Dan. One of the things you can look at on the <clears throat> unemployment front, and, and maybe I'll put charts on Twitter with this for the sometime in the next week. I'll let you guys know. But Mario and I were looking at this today. Also, wait, I need to mention, Mario Please. wrote the blog this week. Whoa. My man. I was busy speaking, and he pinch hit, and he did a great job. So, Sort of the Manny Mario. Moda of SoFi. Now, I know you don't know who that is. No idea. When, you, when Dan starts talking, you can Google it. I'm sure there are people there. Anyway, please. Anyway, so 
the the blog this week will be called investment strategy view rather than Liz looks at for obvious reasons. So the unemployment rate, one of the things that we were looking at earlier today is that some of the early warning signs are things like the number of people that have been unemployed for 26 weeks or more. That chart has started to turn up. That turns up and rises right before recessions, rises obviously during recessions. The other thing we looked at is the, the amount of people that were unemployed for five weeks or less. That chart has turned down, which is exactly what happens right before a recession because people stay unemployed longer. So there are some warning signs aside from the state stuff that we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, state unemployment rates being higher than national mm -hmm. unemployment rates. There are some of these little warning signs that are starting to show decidedly more concerning trends. All right. One last chart here um, that will be in your note tomorrow. So you have S&P 500 EPS consensus. This is Jan 1, 2024 to start the year versus today. Um, so the light blue line is where they are today. If you look at this, okay, so um, where we're coming in versus consensus, um, you know, you, you see it like there, there's something that's going to switch about mid-year or yep. so, right? So talk yep. to us a little bit about this relationship as far as expectations for S&P 500 earnings because that really is the game right here right like absolutely where we are relative to expectations yep so there are two big takeaways from this chart the mm -hmm. reason that we chose this topic this week is because we're at that sort of in-between time where most of the s p has reported and now we're starting to anticipate first quarter results so looking forward to that the first big takeaway from this chart is that you can see that what actually happened in q4 earnings season was much better than what was expected but then the revisions for q1 and q2 we're downward. Mm -hmm. So the assumption here, naturally looking at this, is that we pulled it forward. And now we're going to have a softer Q1 and Q2 because Q4 was stronger than expected. That's not necessarily a bad thing. They're both still positive. It still could eke out decent growth. But the assumption that I feel like has been happening for a while now, that Q3 and Q4 are going to be so much stronger, also could end up being the case. But I, it's starting to feel like let's just push it out further and mm -hmm. things will get better later. Things will get better when. And we don't have to worry about it today in this moment because all we're obsessed with right now is where stocks are trading today and for the next 48 hours. But this, I think, is pushing off the optimism to a point of just, well, we'll figure it out. That, but that's so true with just about everything we talk about in terms of we'll just continue to push it out. You talk about, obviously, a government shutdown. You know what? Continuing resolution, we'll push it out. In terms of Fed rate cuts, we'll push it out. Everything, the reason I even mention that is because that gives the market, yet again, another green light to sort of do the levitation act. And I guess in the absence of anything negative, you know, the market's going to continue to do what it's doing. Again, yesterday, notwithstanding, on reasons that I still don't fully, completely understand, and then today it's right back in the saddle again. Yeah, right? and again, you know, so yesterday's action started with Apple weakness down on headlines, uh, Tesla weakness uh, on headlines, Google continued negative um, headlines there. And so, you know, part of the narrative is kind of simple. If you want to kind of play it out, you know, we were at the Mag 7 and now we're at the Fab 4. Which ones are next? Let's just look at this. Here's a, a tweet from Bespoke uh, Investment and they were talking about Apple. And so here's the oversold nature of this uh, stock here. So the fact of the matter is with the S&P and the NASDAQ at all-time highs and Apple, the second biggest market cap in the both of these indexes behind Microsoft, the fact that you can have that stock up 13% from its recent highs and still have new highs mm -hmm. in the market, that is pretty impressive. Now, obviously, Google was 13% up its highs. Tesla is well, you know, 50% off its highs from a few years ago, but down 25% or so just in the last month and a half. There is a broadening out. Make no mistake about Absolutely. it. Let's just be really clear about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Leadership's leadership. And we started the week talking about, you know, the MAG 7, okay, in Q4 of 2023 had basically 60% earnings growth. And the rest of the 493 in Q4 had a negative 1.5%. Okay. So that is not broad from an earnings standpoint, which right. is why I think your past chart about expectations for the balance of this year are important. Let's do this now. Let's get a Microsoft day chart. Let's just see what's happened to this stock. Pull it up. But, right. I want to make a quick comment yeah, about yeah. this. So it's Bespoke, it's a great organization. Yep. They're pointing out Apple is now more than three standard deviations below its 50-day moving average. Holy shit. Yep. Yet when an NVIDIA, or I can name probably to 15 upside, or, yes, I know where you're going. or 20 names Classic. that have been two, three, 10 standard deviations above their moving, yep. nobody cares, right? When it's, when it's negative, people are quick to point it out. When it's positive, it's business as usual. Which is, again, I understand it. People's want is to be bullish. When the market goes higher, 
the majority, if not 99.5% of people, obviously do well. But the fact that we're highlighting this, to me, is sort of indicative of this entire market and the way people think about yeah, this. Anyway, and, please. No, and, and it, it's a really good point. And, and again, we're not just trying to like just only pick at the things that are red on a screen that is you know raging, but it's important. Let's just pull up the Microsoft day chart because I think this one is really interesting. Yesterday, we were focused on the fact I said, I think one of our rundown point bullet points guy was the most important mm -hmm. trend line other than NVIDIA. Let's just do a one day here. Is this a one day? So you see the stock you know, got hit kind of hard after the opening uh, one day. Yeah. And and now it's basically trading very near the highs of the day and it's unchanged. You could do the same thing for Apple. You could do the same thing for Tesla. They're all coming back kind of hard. So people are looking at oversold conditions and some of these names where the sentiment's really bad and they're buying them. Let's pull up the chart that we had in the QQQ. Liz, you know what we call this one. Okay. This is the NASDAQ 100. And you're going to see these trend lines here. You're going to see the uptrend. I don't know if she's privy to this, by well, the she way. Might not. So I that, see that rising, the see that rising, that, that rising 200 day moving average. Mm -hmm. She's going to work its way into that thing. What do we call this thing, Liz? The hungry alligator. Yeah, it is the hungry wow. alligator. Why is it an alligator and not a crocodile? Thank you. I've brought, see it. Threatening. It's a, she thinks exactly the way I've said the same thing. I've said the same exact thing. Listen, the I, same exact listen, way that she said. We respect Carter Braxton worth his work like no others. Like oh, you and I, we're we're like we're the biggest. Fans. He's, he's on your I feel really man. bad that we've Yellowstone. done this to his profession <laughs> because we've come up with names. Guy, you've had some really crappy names. hundred percent. BK's had some crappy yeah. names. I had the tri remember the triangle of death. Triangle of death yeah. was a thing. Yeah, that no. was a thing. All right, so mm -hmm. let's talk about this. That rising two hundred day, but if you look at it, it's still well above. That's like three eighty five well, guy for the. Q, so Q, this Q is here. this That's is not an individual days. stock. I mean, this is right. And you're talking about standard deviations Correct. away. I mean, why don't we? Why doesn't Bespoke do a thing on the triple Bespoke. Qs? Yeah, isn't that what they're called? By the way, Manny Moda had 149 career pinch hits. Think about that. For what? For what? He what, played with a number of organizations. Of Most organizations. people know them as the Dodgers. Anyway, back to you, Dan. Yeah. All right. So, so at some point, listen. I'm just going to say it, and you guys are not going to be shocked by this. At some point in 2024. You are going to have the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100, is going to break that uptrend line and it's going to meet its maker, which is that 200 day mm -hmm. movie. Yeah, it's going to happen. There's going to be at least a 10% pullback, in my opinion. And, and again, I'll go back to this. If you can look at me and say, oh, he's the best contra indicator I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> listen or whatever, go ahead, buy him here, people. Okay. I'm just saying, have at it. Have okay? at it. But, but Liz, but Liz, <laughs> like if you are bullish, OK, and you believe in the secular trends that are driving a handful of stocks that are driving the entire stock market. Don't you want some of the froth? Don't you want to see the whites of their eyes a little bit to see what they are made of? The folks that have been buying these stocks over the last three sure. months. All right. So so talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I want to go back. I'm going to get super nerdy on our yeah, audience like for a second. Oh, go ahead. And you can use this at your next cocktail party. This was to the point of like standard deviations on the way down. We talk about it as if it's some catastrophic thing, but standard deviations on the way up, we don't. That has long been the case. Mm -hmm. And there are actually ratios that have been created to point to that same phenomenon. So we talk about sharp ratios. I think most, most people know what a sharp ratio is, right? It adjusts for volatility, but it uses, returns for it, returns. but it uses the returns on the upside and the downside. There's a Sortino ratio that removes volatility Correct. on the upside. It of only focuses on volatility on the downside. And everybody that is out there trying to analyze stocks right now, I would urge you to use more of a sharp ratio approach than a Sortino it's ratio funny. approach. Funny, guy is a huge ignores. I, I had, Sortino. The, well, Cordial Santino. Fan. Oh. But that was I, Santino. Oh, really? But that, he was your favorite Corleone. <laughs> no, you'd think he would be. But Michael. Michael. Because there's a lot. Stare. Let me tell you something. You have no idea. There's yeah. a lot. Michael and I share a lot of. Because I could whack somebody like that and sleep like a baby we had uh melissa lee of yeah there is something wrong with me. on the on yeah. the tape podcast is going to drop friday in your favorite podcast store yeah. and 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 guy of course as he does on probably every other podcast with every guest he's like so you know the godfather well, and she goes which one yeah and he goes, well, only two and then, well, and she goes, and only two and she's three, like yeah. what about the third and then you just gave her i didn't you gave even, her a michael corleone i didn't stare, i didn't even say a word yeah no, but Didn't my point, my response. point to her now, Amanda's like, guys, stop it's begging fine. you. Good. Don't worry. My point to her was because she did this documentary. Yes. Uh -huh. And when you film Just these docs, shot. an hour long doc, you might have 43 minutes yeah. of, of right. you know, airtime and you're because yeah. they're commercials. I said, how many hours? And she was like, you'd be surprised how many hours of footage just to. And, I, and we talked about, were you upset that a certain number of things didn't make it? And she said she was. My point to her, Dan, was. Yes. 
James Kahn would say in later life that he was really crestfallen that so much of the basically the video, the videos, the scenes that he did were cut out of the movie. He understand it was for the greater good, yeah. but he did so much that didn't make it to the movie. And he was upset about this yeah. anyway. So I'm not Santino. So wait, sharp ratio versus Sorrentino. Ratio. That, well, that, that's it's, my it's just fault. a point that like sorry, in statistics, that. even we've figured out that people care about <laughs> certain things and you find ways to zero in on, okay, what, what really matters to people then? But is that even the right way to look at it? Because you're actually just making it so much more narrow of a view. So that's my whole point. Don't make it so narrow of a view that it only matters on the downside. I know it hurts more on the downside, but the upside volatility matters too, because it's a warning mm -hmm. sign. You don't want things to swing that much. And just volatility in Fed rate cut expectations. It's not supposed to happen that way, right? Treasury yield volatility isn't supposed to happen this way. So there's a whole lot going on. But Dan, to your question about don't you want to see the whites of their eyes, yeah. the people that have, have bought these stocks? Yeah, I think some do. I think right now, Every day I start to feel more and more like we are in late cycle euphoria and that people are just not on blind hope. I think that these themes do have legs, but on the hope that the market will survive it all, the economy will survive it all, and there's no data that proves us otherwise. So no matter how overextended it seems or feels, we have to keep buying because otherwise we might miss it. Yeah. So I think the whites of their eyes have it's happened a little bit in the ones that have gone up so much. And that's why we're seeing the broadening out because they it they got tired of that valuation and now they just started to buy other stuff. But some of that stuff doesn't have the same basis, I guess, is what I would say. All right. We got one last topic before Guy Adami has to 5, go 000. here. And this was something um, I think that Liz brought up here. And it's something that Guy is, is uh, mm. you talk about quite often. Um, the first time in a very long time, David Rosenberg, I saw that in Rosie's note um, over at Rosenberg Research this time, uh, this morning. First time that Bitcoin and gold have ever made an all-time together high together i thought that uh -huh. was really interesting talk to us a little bit about that guy because you've been on the gold trade you've been saying that we're going to have the sort of parabolic move that we have had over the last week and it's interesting forget its correlation to gold the correlation to the nasdaq is kind of interesting right like in general so like what are you thinking here well you know i take. think people are looking at this as a risk on like it's it's clear selling for everything i look at it obviously a little bit differently i think gold specifically but bitcoin to a point are telling a much more nefarious story i think bitcoin the move in bitcoin is for obvious reasons the etf and i get all those things and institutional demand but i also think it's a concern about central banks specifically in this case i think what's going on in china and they're seemingly grasping at straws but making its way over here as well in terms of some of the debt levels gold in a lot of ways the same thing so both are rallying at the same time i think we'd be having a much different conversation if there was a continuation to the downside in the s p and then people would have that aha moment mm -hmm. saying you know what bitcoin and gold are actually sort of the precursor for market sell-off but with the s p up 40 something handles today people are not taking that in consideration. I look at both of those and say, this might be a very early warning sign as to what's to come. But I'm not suggesting I'm right, but that's how I look at it. Well, it, to me, it's just the relationship. And I sincerely did want your answer on that. Because if you look at when gold might surge, I would expect it to surge in times of fear. I would mm -hmm. expect it to surge when we had concerns over the value of the dollar. And I would expect it to surge when there was a lot of macro uncertainty. And right now, it doesn't seem like a ton of that is happening. Everybody seems pretty certain about the macro environment. There doesn't seem to be much fear out there. We've got credit spreads at the narrowest that they've been, I think, for the whole cycle. I mean, yeah. it's, it's wild. Yet gold is catching this bid that's straight up, <clears throat> right? And it's an asset class that much like the volatility that I just talked about that isn't characteristic, this is an asset class that doesn't usually see big jumps. It doesn't usually see parabolic moves like that where suddenly all these buyers came in. And I I want to know who the buyers are. Who well, are these new buyers? We had Stuart Sop on the on the tape podcast uh, last Friday and Guy in him spoke about that very thing in central banks. It's, we walked out a little bit. You, you know, you've been talking about that. And I think it's been really under the radar as far as gold It's like, you know, it doesn't have the sort of movement that that nerd gold, the Bitcoin does yeah. right when it goes to the upside. But it's had a really sneaky bid for the better part of the last couple of years as it's been because maybe they can pull up well just a there's a chart scene that's uh, interesting uh, you know there's that scene in jaws which i love they're on the beach and the mayor <laughs> is talking to roy scheider the me the chief of police and he's basically telling him you don't want to create a panic if you say barracuda on a crowded beach people yeah. sort of look around yeah. no it doesn't bother anybody 
you yell shark and the line is you have a panic on the 4th of July. And it's the same thing with, the, you know, all these crazy things can go higher. And I think the powers that be are not going to be concerned. For example, Bitcoin, gold goes higher and gold's making new highs. And a lot of people in very important seats say, what the F is going on? Like right. that, that's something that catches people attention. And we say this, we used to say it back in the day when I did this for a living in terms of commodity trading, gold is not a story until it is, which sounds glib as hell. It's not intended to be, but we're on the precipice of exactly that happening. I think the institutional money is on the sidelines still. I think everybody might be bullish of gold. I don't think the market is nearly as long of gold as it can be. And if we get a couple of closes above these current levels, you're going to start to see this thing move in a violent way. And you're going to start to see gold miners for the first time in a long time start to play catch up. Yeah. One thing that's interesting, if you just look at this chart here, you see what really does look like a consolidation. If you kind of move it over to the left a little bit, you'll see like that recent breakout. There you go. Um, you know, I'll just say this. All right. We're going to goodbye guy. Adami. We don't have to say well, No, we're going to say goodbye. Gonna walk yeah, hey, everyone, you know, just give him a little clap but, out but, or something like but that. But send your questions yeah, in. Send your questions in. Liz and I are going to take them. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Well, I don't, we'll I'm not going to. I'm going to put back that yeah. screen. Yeah, and, and, oh, I want that camera on. Oh, look. Oh, look, look they want to follow us at Guy Adami, Dan S. Nathan, and at risk for social media on the insta we keep putting out previews and stuff like that liz is at liz young strat she's up there so follow her too all right guy bye um you know it's interesting about let's pull up that gold chart one more time is that you know it's had a number of you know eight to ten eleven percent moves in just this this consolidation period so i think what guy's saying is like if we were really to have some sort of like financial calamity or something like that that's probably when you start to see this thing move i i for i hope that doesn't happen liz I'll right just uh, me too yeah yeah you know what i mean well so. but it's i wonder too though how much of that is already sort of being priced in and maybe some of this move today even is that your yeah. community bank is down 40 percent again yeah. so renewed fears about regional banks. And, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I've held gold in two different forms since the beginning of last year. And surprisingly, it's done, you know, I'm up double digits in yeah. that. And that's not, again, it's not an asset class that I would have expected to be up that much in, especially in a year where we seemingly averted recession and anything bad that could have happened. Yeah. So something fishy is going on here. I don't have the answer, but something about this just doesn't smell right. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think you, if you just want to extrapolate it, it's like, okay, we started this conversation talking about how the market, the stock market, and many other risk asset markets do seem to be somewhat dislocated from, you know, what, what's going on in the macro. And, you know, just if you want to isolate the U.S. and the soft landing here, like, like make no mistake about it, people, like the soft landing is here. You know what I mean? Like rates have stayed higher much longer than most people thought they would at any point in 2023 coming into this year, that sort of thing. And what Fed Chair Powell is kind of saying to you right now is like, they're not probably coming until the fall, right? And right. you know what I mean? Like, so, so again, you know, GDP looks okay, unemployment's fine, you know, manufacturing's, you know, like again, they're softening a little bit. So Fed Chair Powell also told us a couple of months ago that they are not at one of the pressers, they're not gonna wait until inflation gets to its target to start cutting. Right. So what does that tell you? You know what I mean? It tells you that they're just yeah. not that comfortable. That was the message from him this morning, but that's also the message in the market right now. Yeah. Well, he I think everybody expected them first to move the target. And then we gave up on the idea that they yeah. were going to move the inflation the target, target, the inflation yeah. target. And then he started to say they things still like, could, by the way, I mean, like, 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 I think don't about think that. they will. Okay. I, I would I would be very surprised and I've been surprised before. So that's not an impossible thing. But I would be very surprised if they did, because I think especially in this cycle, given the issues that we've had with inflation, if they yeah. moved the target, it would be them saying we don't have the tools to fix it. We can't get it to where it needs to be. So we have to change our target. He started to say things like we needed to be on a sustainable path toward 2%. That's what they're not confident in yeah. yet. And I don't think they should be confident in that yet, especially given where services inflation is. I know, but so that I think goes, it's okay that he says that. Yeah, but that but, goes back to the point we talked about on Monday's pod on the on the tape. It's mm -hmm. like, I just don't think there's enough attention being fo like focused on just how weak China is and like if yeah, they start right. dumping goods yeah. and then we get and into a, 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 a bigger yeah. trade war, what that means for companies as it relates to, you know, hiring, what it means to wage mm -hmm. growth. I mean, wages are a huge part of services. So like, I don't know how you can be bearish, you know, expecting that unemployment is going to go up, mm -hmm. you know, economically mm -hmm. and think that that won't put downward pressure on wages. Right. You know what I mean? Like, well, so, it, and it will. And if you look at, so Jolt's numbers, yeah. there's a component of Jolt's called the quits rate something to watch yep. just as a precursor it dropped again today and as it drops so usually 
wage growth lags the quits rate. I know that sounds like a strange relationship, but wage growth lags the quits rate by about nine months. So if the quits rate has come down. Think about what that means. People are not voluntarily quitting as much as they did before. Yep. So they're not feeling quite as secure or quite as optimistic that they'd find a better paying job somewhere else. So the quits rate is down. If wage growth lags that by a nine month period, then you see continuing deceleration in wages. Yep. And that probably is coupled with some of the other things that I talked about before, where you know people unemployed for 26 weeks or more, that sort of thing. So there will be a weakening. But to be clear, it's never really been that nothing will weaken. Even the, the most mm -hmm. bullish of bulls could have said, you know, the economy, of course, needs to cool off from where it is. Right. So it's never been that there won't be a weakening. It's just a matter of what's our definition of weakening and what we can withstand and what's the Fed's well, definition. Well, I mean, listen, and we make this point on all of our podcasts a lot. You know, the economy is not the market. The market mm -hmm. is not the economy. So the economy clearly is, you know, well, let's say weakening relative to some of those unexpected, you know, positive prints that we saw in 2023. The thing that has not weakened at all is the stock market. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so like that's the disconnect. And you may say, well, you come on here and you rant every day or whatever. All right, let's pull up um let, let's let's start taking so i'm getting exhausted yeah. people let's start so speaking of though yeah. but our audience it's going to give us these wonderful questions i spoke at a conference this morning and a fella came up to me afterwards and he said thank you for your comments i really loved yeah. you know what you said on the panel and he said by the way i'm a market call watcher i listen to everything no that you do with dan awesome. and guy and i love it so and so a he fella. was like i already knew you know what some of your takes were and everything yeah. but he gave a great compliment and he was a a loyal viewer, a loyal listener, yeah. um, Chicago well, listen, guy, Bears fan. So a little knock there, but anyway, I got over it. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. like, um, I know you're at Stephanie Link's event. I've spoken that in the past, um, and it's a great event, and and a lot of really smart participants there, which I think is really kind of fun. When I say smart, there are obviously you know lots of our folks who you know most of our folks are very smart. Um, some people hate watch us actually. By the way, I know that <laughs> okay. fact because oh, yeah. I've seen the emails. Yeah. Um, but that event is filled with a lot of financial advisors, right? And and like right. who are in the audience. And right. there was a lot of great people speaking there. So um, thank you for that compliment. All right, let's go to the questions here and keep giving them to Amanda. We're going to try to go right up till two o'clock um, Eastern time. This is from JT. Tom Lee uh, of Fundstrat called a short-term S&P top around 5250. Do you see us passing that before pulling back? Okay, so right now the SPX is trading at 5108. It's up a uh, 7% or so on the year. It's off a little bit from its highs. The all-time high made just the other day, two days ago, was 5150 or so. Um, mm -hmm. So he's done another mm -hmm. hundred. Listen, another hundred points on a 5100 S&P is, is not a whole heck of a lot. Right. Thoughts, Liz, you don't have S&P targets. Nope. Um, you keep a close eye, as we just looked at in, in the notes from your blog that's going to drop tomorrow, that you obviously are focused very much on S&P earnings estimates, which you have ideas on valuation ranges and the like here. Mm -hmm. Talk to us on how you should be thinking about this, because it's really hard to kind of just say 5250, that's it. I'm sure Tom, and I know he does a lot of really good quant work, mm -hmm. so I'm sure that 5250 number is not him just going like this. It has something to do with a, a whole host of inputs. Is that probably mm -hmm. fair? I would imagine. And I'm yeah. trying to do some quick math just to Okay, you want me to keep what, talking while you're doing the math? What that be. Um, on, a, on, a, on a versus the above, above the highest. Yeah, so, okay. So 5250 is about 7% above where the highest moving average is on the S&P right now. We've got a 50-day moving average yeah. at about 4,900. 5250 would be 7% above that. I, maybe that's a midpoint between 5 and 10%. Here's here's an easy explanation for that, which is that we know the market overshoots on the upside and the downside. How much does it usually overshoot by? And, and this is a rule of thumb that I've operated under. There is not a whole lot of science to it, really just feels. If it gets 5% extended, you usually see almost another 5 from there before it gives it up. So if it gets across that 5% level, then it probably keeps going for a while. I think we've been proven in this market many times over that momentum is here. It's strong. It keeps going and that there are still buyers out there, no matter how irrational some of it may seem. So again, I don't, I mean, I don't think 5250 is that outrageous. Yeah. It, it might happen tomorrow. <laughs> for all we know, well, right? we're, well, just think about what we have the rest of this week, right? So we have Fed Chair Powell speaking again. So whatever he said today, he's going to be reiterating. Mm -hmm. He's also, like I would say, let's throw the 200-day moving average in here too, um, as they're telestrating here. 
Um, and then we have the, the jobs report on, you know, Friday morning. So if the jobs report, you know, reinforces what at least what the equity market participants, what people who are basically, you know, buying treasuries, uh, ultimately selling yield mm -hmm. price right here, right? If that is a continuation or there's like inputs uh, in, in the data on Friday that support that, throw in the 200 day moving average on this chart, if you will. Um, like to me, you know, like, okay, you might see a push up to 5,250, but at some point I really do think that we're gonna see a move back towards that $4,600 uh, 4, breakout level. The 200 day moving average is gonna be there. Um, that is my two cents on that. All right. Well, you, the other thing is keep in mind March 12th, which is exactly six days from now, which would be next Tuesday. And I know we'll talk about this on the pod next Monday. Yeah, We get another CPI report. I feel like we just got one, but we get another CPI report. So depending on how that might come in, that could change things too. Could it? Yeah. All right. Let's go to another one here. This is from Matt that, um, I, if that is your last name, Matt, that's pretty cool. Um, he says, yes. What does Dan think about holding a small position in NVDY rather than actually holding NVIDIA to gain exposure with reduced risk? All right, I'm going to look at what that is because Amanda just put this one in my uh, thing. So one of the things I would just say is that um, – if you look at, we talked about this on Fast Money last night. So we talked about how weak most of the tech space was, um, right? So NVDY. And then Melissa mentioned that SMCI, Supermicro, which is being added to the S&P 500, which was down, I think, you know, seven, 8% or something had a 10% reversal, okay, to close up on the day. And NVIDIA, which was down, I want to say three or 4%, also closed um, up on the day. So I think about that and like the, the you know, the, the question was like, isn't that kind of bullish? I it's to me, it's the exact opposite of bullish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, like when you have the sort of widespread selling that you saw, and then the two names that have encapsulated all of the enthusiasm or a lot of the enthusiasm in this latest run, specifically in 2024, let's just pull up an NVIDIA chart for a second here, because what's gone on since it's breakout at $500 on its way to $900. Um, this is not something that's, particularly normal in the stock market. If that was a small cap biotech stock or something like that, I'd say there's some great thing going on here. That near parabolic move is a trillion dollars in market cap. Okay. A trillion until five years ago, there was not a stock in the U S stock market that had a trillion dollar market cap that just happened in two and a half months. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's unnatural. So to me, not particularly bullish. Um, I know why you think it is because it makes new highs every day. The last thing I'll just say here. So this is the yield max NVIDIA option income ETF as an exchange traded fund incorporated in the United States. The fund's primary investment objective is to seek current income. Okay. The, Using uh, options and NVIDIA. Okay. I mean, listen. does that happen? So I uh, question you, yeah. you know more about the options market than me. The fact that there's an ETF that exists only for options of one stock. Is that normal? No. Or is this an indication this that just new. just the existence yeah. of this investment? Yeah, this is from Tor Torasso Investments in Massapequa. Massapequa is the home of Joey Buttafuoco. Um, I don't know if okay. you remember Joey Buttafuoco uh, and my main man Nappy that I went to college with. I, listen, I, I I don't know what the inputs in this thing. I'm sure there's a lot of decay in this thing. So if you own it, it's going to be decaying in your face. Um, so my just gut is like I would like run. Uh, not walk from something like this. <laughs> um, but NVIDIA is likely at this point, if it's just below 900, it's likely to go to a thousand people. That's the way a lot of these things work a little bit. Liz, thoughts on semis. Let's pull up the SMH here for yeah. a second. Um, you know, NVIDIA has become 26% or so of the SMH. You see what happened. It broke out at 160. It's trading at 228 right now. Obviously, NVIDIA has been powering um, a lot of that move. If you look at the other members, Taiwan Semi today uh, gapped up five percent it's nine and a half percent then you have amd six and a quarter broadcom which reports tomorrow after the close that's going to be fairly uh important thoughts on semis is just a group that as carter has been telling us just got back to its relative performance versus the s p 500 for the first time since 2000 since the year 2000 24 years um to me that's not something I want to buy. It's something I want to recognize, but it right. also speaks to the outperformance we've seen in the space by a handful of names. Well, I think it. this is this answer is dependent on whether you've already owned them or whether you're trying to find an entry point yeah. right now. And I don't think that this is a good entry point to your point, Dan. But I do think that there's probably still a little bit more room given the fact that 
fear seems to be completely absent in the market right yeah. now. So something that's so speculative and is such a direct tie to this AI theme, I think there probably is a little bit more room to go. So if you hold it, no need to be running for the door today, but I would keep a very close eye on it. And if things do start to falter and you start to see some of the big names give up some steam, maybe, you know, average out. And if you still want to be exposed, if you still want to be exposed to tech, rotate into some software names, rotate into some other stuff that isn't quite as frothy. But this is another source that I think money will come out of as valuations continue to be extended. Money will come out of and rotate into some of those other parts of the market, and that'll drive a lot more of this everything is broadening out narrative. Yeah, that's a good segue to a question that we have here. Um, this is from, it was on Adobe. I just saw it here. Hold on, let me find it here. So this is from... Who the hell is it? Sorry about that, people. I'm a little discombobulated <laughs> at the moment. Um, maybe they can pull it up on the screen. Adobe, Adobe, Adobe. There it is. Scott A. Question for Dan. What do you think of Adobe being a beneficiary of AI currently trades at around a five-year average PE? So let's pull up the chart here. It's interesting. Made a little bit of a double top. It sold off kind of hard over the last couple of weeks or so. And so there you get a little bit of the multiple contraction stocks down um 15% during that time period sitting right on that moving average so from a technical standpoint um at a really crucial spot when i think about what liz just said about finding other ways to express this view of course this company is doing a whole host of stuff on the image front and this is um a productivity tool that a lot of thought knowledge workers use and so they have been incorporating ai and machine learning into a lot of their processes and if you think that you like microsoft for the same reason their access to the open ai ip and how they're working through their productivity suites and how they're going to be able to charge more for them and get higher margin and all that sort of stuff great that's the story that's going to be also the story with adobe but it is worth noting for whatever reason, Adobe right now is not participating. Look at how Adobe has actually consolidated over the last six months or so. Now, I'm going to show you another chart that did that too. But expectations for 2024, earnings growth for Adobe, about 12%, 13% next year, okay? And I think about it as far as sales are concerned, about the same, 11% expected growth, 12%. Trade 30 times this year, 27 times next year. This is a company that has 89% gross margin. So pretty good growth, not gangbusters, trading at more than two and a half X those expected growth rates. I'll have you, Liz, speak to just that, not the specific stock, but more that premium to its growth rate and the way the stock acts right now, not particularly great. You know what I mean? There's yeah. a, couple, it's a couple disconnects here. Yeah, especially after the comment that I just made about momentum. If the momentum in this one starts to go to the downside, yep. then obviously people overpaid for it at that valuation. So you want to watch for that, obviously. Right now, though, investors want growth. They are paying up for growth. And I will never miss an opportunity to bring up small caps. Small cap growth has been what has driven the small cap resurgence. So this idea of small caps broadening out has largely been driven by the small cap growth trade, not the small cap value trade. Mm -hmm. So even in risky parts of the market, investors just want growth. And I think value continues to get left behind. So they're willing to pay the premium for expected growth down the road, I think at some point, again, and, and Doug Cass sent us a message uh, about this, you do have to normalize those multiples. Yep. You got to normalize not just it's it's price to growth. It's it's the peg ratio, right? It's the PE ratio. It might be the price to book ratio. You have to normalize all of those. And investors have to get back to a little bit more rational place about how much they're willing to pay for each incremental unit of growth. Yeah, let's do a one year chart on this Adobe for a second. And just again, this is, you know, a visual medium here at Market Call. And so, like pulling up that chart, I mean, to me, you know, $500 seems like a really logical level. This is a level that the stock bounced on in October, late, you know, late October, late September, mid August. It was a breakout level in July. So you can see that. And I just want you guys to see that consolidation. Now, let's make it a five year chart for a second here. Um, and, and again, this is just some of the ways we kind of think about these sorts of things. You know, this stock has not even gotten back to those prior highs, which I think is interesting. So it speaks to what Liz is just saying about momentum and how important it is as around narratives, around people buying into secular shifts and trying to figure out the ways in which to pay uh, play them. You know, back in 2021, when that stock was above or just touched $700, AI wasn't even a dream. You know what I mean? It wasn't something that people were paying up for. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it can't get back to those Fugazi levels from 2021 on a real secular narrative 
tells you that maybe investors are feeling not so optimistic about their um, outcomes or potential outcomes there. I want to go quickly back to NVIDIA for a second, and maybe we can look at um, a one-year chart because this will take us back to when the stock gapped up in May after that huge beat and raise. Look what it did afterwards. It also consolidated between $400 and $500 for six months. We talked about that. And, you know, again, I said it on Market Call in Jan 7th. I went on Fast Money on Jan 5th. I said, this stock is about to explode. I'm not telling you fundamental reasons. I'm uh, like, and, you know what I mean? But like that, some of those consolidations keep banging up against those levels. If you have the, the tailwind of a strong secular shift, um, that's what can happen. Not to the tune of going from 500 to 900 in two months, Liz, but um, you know, so that I just wanted to bring that up. All right. Here's a question um, about Disney. This is more me. Oh no, no, let's do this. Scott A. I'd like to know what Liz's thoughts are on the 210 spread which yeah. one is priced incorrectly in your view the two both of them are the 10 all right get, how about it liz let's talk about it i mean the fact that it's still inverted and that we just willfully right, why does, why are why are you exasperated by that like so like talk to me like what what, what like because the narrative has moved to now okay we accomplished it soft yeah. landing is here we have solved inflation we are off to the races mid-cycle everything's fine yeah but the yield curve is still inverted it's not normal this is not normal Liz, behavior. it's different this time it's just not that it's different, different and we're gonna find i mean it's always a little different yeah. the catalyst is always different of what takes us into the crisis and, and this isn't a crisis but the catalyst is always different i just don't think that the shakeout ends up being that much different on the other side so which one is mispriced <clears throat> um I don't know that either of them are terribly mispriced in the moment because the Fed hasn't started cutting rates. But if and when they do start cutting rates, I think the short end of the curve is mispriced. But here's the thing. When it's mispriced, you can take advantage of it. You can sit in it and get paid. And now you have to go shorter. You have to go about 12 months or shorter to get paid. But you can sit there and get paid in a completely risk-free investment knowing that the moment in time when they are going to cut rates is only getting closer, not further away. So I think probably the short end is a little more mispriced. We've talked about a few times on this show that the 10-year now, I think, actually has the propensity to stay higher, especially if services inflation stays higher. So we could end up in an environment that none of us have seen for a very long time where we've got a higher than what has been normal 10-year yield, which is something that companies will have to withstand, borrowers will have to withstand the mortgage market will have to withstand. But I do think the short end of the curve will slowly come down and the curve will uninvert. And think about what we said before with that chart by what was the account on Twitter that you guys like that showed that Fed funds cutting chart and the market not doing well? Oh, uh, Game of Trades. Okay. So think about what we talked about before. If and when that happens, this goes hand in hand with us saying it's never the hikes that get you. It's the cuts. It's not the inversion that gets you. It's the re-steepening. If and when the Fed starts cutting, they're likely to do it partially, at least partially, because things have gotten cooler or have gotten weaker. That coincides with the curve re-steepening, Fed cutting, market getting trepidatious. It all sort of happens around the same time. And that's the part that I don't think is going to be that different this time. All right, fair enough. This is from Jim Foster. This is on a single name. Um, and, and actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna broaden this one out for you, Liz, once I kind of answer this question. Um, but it said maybe Dan could speak about Disney and whether or not it might fill in the gap. Um, great question. So Disney is a company that I find really fascinating. There's some folks um, who love to hate this stock when it was on its, let's look at a five year for a second here, when it was on its way down from that kind of $200 level from its heights in 2021, all the way down to that COVID low. I mean, just think about that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like, you know, 200 to $80. This is Disney. This is a stock that as long as I've been in the business for 25 years, I've heard no shortage of people, old and young, say whether they have grandkids or not, I hold it for my grandkids. You know, mm -hmm. what, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And let's pull it out 10 years because this is kind of fascinating. I remember when, you know, streaming was, you know, a thing, right? And it had this huge ramp, you know, 10 years ago on the expectation of what they were going to be able to do with their catalog and the like here. So I think about this stock. All right, now let's go back to a one-year basis. Okay, what's going on here? Bob Iger's come back. JPEG went back. Has got involved in the culture wars. It got involved in the streaming wars. It got involved in the um, the proxy wars. Oh, I just you see what it's I did there. That was part of, of, a lot of wars. A lot of wars. Um, so gaps are generally meant to be filled. Carter was on on Tuesday and said this as we were talking about, or maybe it was Monday. Um, we were talking about Target. 
And mm-hmm. we we're talking about the gap that Target had had after its last earnings report. It's a big gap. It's a huge gap, like 17% or something like that. And Carter said something interesting. Carter has forgotten more about charts than I'll ever know. I talk about mm-hmm. charts a lot, but I mean that. He said, usually gaps come in twos after they've kind of inflected or something oh, like that. Look at the gap that, that it had. And not only did it have that gap, Look at it. It gapped up again today and kept on going. All right. So let's go back to this Disney chart here. So Disney because of consumer spending on goods. Well, possibly. I mean, it also like, listen, this is a company that was going up against some easy comps, right? Like when you think about it, they had massive inventory issues, a lot of very stock, you know, company specific sort of things. So that stock did gap a few months ago. It's had another gap here. It's consolidated here, you know, after that big earnings report. I think that's kind of interesting here. You know, the company is not particularly cheap. Nelson Peltz is trying to get some board seats, trying to shake some things up. I think Bob Iger ultimately prevails, but look at it on a five-year basis, look at it on valuation, look at it on whatever you like. You know, I mean, listen, this one's probably okay. If it were to fill in that gap just with the market, that's how I think about it. If it filled in the gap of the market and you like the story and you like what Bob Iger's new plan is, then you look for the opportunity to buy it. So that's the longer term chart. To me, probably gets to that 200 day moving average, not so distant future. Maybe you see a pullback from there. Thoughts, Liz, on, I want to pull up Nike and Starbucks, mm. consumer discretionary. That's mm. what I'm going to broaden this out to. So right. Nike and Starbucks, a lot of exposure to China, okay? You would say that Disney had a lot of exposure to Chinese, um, you know, uh, consumer uh, consumers, but also tourists, if you will. Mm-hmm. But look at how poorly these two stocks trade. And I think it has a lot to do with China. Thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it does have a lot to do with China because these are two stocks like they're not they're not new stocks. They're not new products to the consumer. So it's obviously the growth when it's when it's a mature company like that, a mature consumer discretionary company, the growth comes from same store sales. Mm -hmm. It comes from opening new stores. It comes from trying to reach parts of the market that you haven't saturated yet. These two companies have obviously saturated Mm -hmm. everywhere. So the growth is harder to come by. Organic growth is harder to come by. So the fact they're not trading well tells me that you know we know that the u.s consumer is still spending we know that things aren't going poorly here as far as wage growth and income and disposable income and the willingness to spend but i do think that there's probably an asian consumer story here but remember back and i've I've referenced this a few times in the past remember back when we were reopening and we were supposed to be relying on the chinese consumer to get us out of all of the COVID stuff yeah. and they never really came through. Yep. It was a little bit, but not as much as we expected. And then the U S actually made up the slack. We spent more and because we had stimulus and we had all this cash that was sloshing around and people just spent all the revenge spending and we still did okay without the Chinese consumer. Yep. So I wonder if this time we could end up doing that as well. I don't, I don't know, but we've done it before. We've gotten through things without the Chinese consumer before. I don't know if we can do it again. All right. Um, one last question here. This is from at risk reversal. Oh, that'd be me. I'm, oh. just, I'm just making it up as we go. We have a few more and I'm sorry, people. Um, uh, Jim Foster has a question on UNH and Humana. I, th- those are guy questions. And you know what? I promise you tomorrow, Amanda's going to save that. We're going to ask guy that question. Okay. Jim Foster. I appreciate that. Um, my question to you, Liz, uh, on a day where the S&P and the NASDAQ are bucking yesterday's trends, getting a lot of those losses back in many of the names, mm-hmm. do you find it interesting that the VIX is basically unchanged on the day at about 14 and a half? Hmm. I find it interesting that we're talking about the VIX so much. I don't mean you talking well, about sounds that. Sounds like you're just but... uh, throwing some shade <laughs> on me. And my question for you is that because really what I, I hear feel about like... it on TV all the time too, and I've started to hear about it in people's commentary that we have to be paying so much attention to the VIX. It's oh, still really? at fourteen. It's well, like you know what? Not... But, but let's let, let's just look at this for a second. So it's interesting. So you see the series of higher lows, which I think is kind uh-huh. of interesting. And, yeah. And a series yeah. of higher highs, and you know, like I, I'm also in the camp. You know, I'm like you know was on options action for ten years. And every time I was on Fast Money, not Options Action, I'd get asked the options questions if my main man Pete wasn't on the show or something like that. Uh And, you know, I'm not like the VIX to me is not like a really important indicator by any means, especially with all these zero days to expiration options and, you know, like what goes on with with vol being suppressed and everything like that. But when you see a pattern like this, I do think it's worth noting a little bit. It's like you're pulling the rubber band back, it gets tighter and tighter. But the VIX is such a different animal. It's not like a stock where you look at it and you're like, oh, it's gaining some strength. We're worried about the strength of it moving or the momentum of it moving. The VIX is a quick hit kind of index. And I do think it will spike again. To me, it doesn't become interesting until it's getting closer to 20. Yeah. 
Um, all right, fair enough. We covered a lot of ground here. And, you know, listen, I, I think it's important to recognize, um, you know, I want to go back to one of those first questions about, you know, Tom Lee. Tom's been on our pods in the past. Tom does, you know, very thoughtful work. Um, Tom's generally been pretty bullish and he sticks with his guns. He's got lots of different inputs and the like here. And so I do think it's interesting. You know, I've seen him on CNBC a bunch over the last, you know, few weeks or so saying that we're very close to a near term top. He's not saying a crash. He's not saying this and that, whatever. He's just saying, and I know that he, puts a lot of work that goes into you know his quant models and probably that's how he gets to a 5250 number i'm sure if you're reading his work over at front strat it's all detailed there um I, I think it's worth paying attention to we started out the week liz talking about you know it's a bunch of strategists tripping each other chasing the market you know what i mean so again you know things feel really frothy if you're really bullish i think you'd welcome a pullback the idea that you can just kind of like grow to the trees growing to the sky makes me a little nervous liz mm -hmm. you yeah I mean, if you're really bullish, it means you want to buy more stuff. And it's probably getting to be a shorter and shorter list of things that look attractive yeah. to buy at these levels. So I agree. If you're if you're bullish, you probably do want a five to ten percent pullback. Yeah. And and you know, just tying it in with that question about Adobe. I mean, Adobe is a stock that is down, you know, 70 basis points on the day today. And so the idea, if you're looking for other ways to play how AI is going to be benefit individual companies or industries and the like. That's where you want to do, and you want to have those lists ready for when we do get a 10% pullback. If the S&P were to go back to 4,600, if the NASDAQ 100 were to come in 10, 12% or something like that, you know, and then it's also important to focus on, listen, at some point, going back to that bespoke, uh, you know, tweet, you know, Apple's getting really oversold. Google is at a big technical level. Tesla, the sentiment couldn't be worse. The, the sentiment in Tesla is about as bad as it was at the end of 2022 when the stock- you bullish on Tesla? No, 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 no. I, I, I would never- <laughs> buy anything that guy is associated with um but you know um yeah so like you know like the, but but that stock will become very tradable like that mm. stock's going down another 10 percent, probably to 160 or so and then you know it's probably going to have a snapback because the sentiment can't get much worse than it is already sentiment that's why we talk about sentiment all the time that's why we talk about how you know strategists are acting or individual analysts and how what percentage of our buys versus sells and holds and that sort of thing because sentiment is a really important driver when you see markets or individual names or individual securities moving in ways that don't make sense to the fundamentals going back to what doug said about the uh, you know being this decoupled from the macro markets that sort of thing that's where sentiment comes into play and that's what's important to understanding it and that's why we show up every day liz young every day every day every day thank you for being here with us we went ot yeah. with the q a guy will be back with me tomorrow we're going to be focused on what butters has to say carter braxton worth of work charting is going to be here we're going to do a special preview of the broadcom that comes out avgo uh-huh avgo I've heard of that. thanks a lot liz will be back with us on the pod on monday and your friend brian belsky is yeah. going to be on with us on Fridays on the Tape podcast. I'm uh, tomorrow on Halftime Report with the Bell. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So we're recording with him probably right after that. So say hi to him and tell I him will. to get ready to just, you know, get it on. And then we are going to be speaking with Melissa Lee also. We already did that, but that's going to be on the Belsky conversation too. So check right. that out. All right. Thanks for everyone for being here. And we will see you tomorrow on the Market Call.